test, test. Praise God, amen. Why don't we all stand? Want to welcome everyone to the Potter's House, amen. Let's worship God in Jesus' mighty name, amen. We are on the live stream right now. We want to welcome those that are watching, amen. Let's worship wherever you are at, amen. Lift your hands, praise Jesus. We're going to sing that song, uh, every praise, amen. Let's give a shout of praise to the Lord. Here we go. mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And God bless you, everyone. We're going to go to the next. Let's sing that song, Revive Us, O Lord. Won't you revive us? Here we go. Yeah. 
Jesus, we worship you, Father. In this place, we give you glory, honor, and praise, God, for your goodness. In Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Sing that slow song, amen, that I butchered uh, Wednesday night, amen. Give God praise and glory, amen. Let's come to the altar before the Lord, amen. In complete awe and amazement when we sing that song. So follow along with me. Lord, I stand in your presence. Here we go. Lord, I stand in your presence. Lord, I stand in your presence, broken before you, and my heart's desire is to love and adore you with all of my heart, with all of my soul forever. And Lord, I fall at your altar, Lord, I fall at your altar, in sweet surrender, and I've never known a mercy so tender. Let's give him praise tonight, Father. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We worship you, our Savior, our King. Father, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Why don't we bow our heads right where you are? In the presence of our God and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, we're going to thank him uh, for his goodness tonight, amen, before his throne. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. As we are. Petitioning the throne of God's power and his grace, amen. Let's go before him in goodness and faith, amen. Let's believe in the God of miracles, of signs, and of wonders. And if you're here tonight, amen, I'm asking right now that you would put everything aside, amen. Let's focus on Jesus, the rock, the foundation, the Savior. He is the horn of our salvation according to the word of God, amen. He is the God who was, who is, and is to come. And the Bible says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith, amen. And we're going to go before his presence again, believing for him to do just tremendous things. We want to continue to lift up families. Obviously, those that are watching on live stream uh, this morning, we're praying for the Hansard family. We're going to continue praying for uh, the House family as well, for God's grace and God's favor over their life as they're helping uh, their mother, Jerry House, who is uh, battling cancer right now. But we truly have a God who intercedes. Can you say amen? amen. He intercedes. For the life of his people, we're going to trust him tonight, amen, putting all trust, all confidence in the name of Jesus. We're lifting up these families. We're going to pray for God to just continue to move in our church as well. We have got to have faith, beloved. I'm seeing good things that are going to happen in the future, but we have to have a positive perspective. And we've got to look thing, uh, things through the lens of Jesus Christ, and he will help us 
in this very time. We're praying for fruitfulness, amen, disciples, men and women of God uh, who will rise up to the occasion. We're going to pray for um, open opportunities in the city of Milwaukee, a building, and we're just going to thank God again for what we have even at this moment, amen. I'm excited for what God has, many things that we can lift up, and I want you to lift up something as well uh, that God would help you in a time of need. So let's do this right now. We're going to lift our voice. We're going to ask for God's favor, amen, uh, and as we open up, I'm going to ask Brother Manny if you'd lift your voice uh, and open us up in prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, this morning. We thank you for the mighty grace of Jesus Christ, for the outpouring of your spirit. Uh, God, help us this morning, God, to come to understand who you are. Uh, we're praying for open doors, God. We're praying for miracles, God, in the city of Milwaukee, God. Uh, closed doors that need to be closed, Father, God, and open new ones, Father, for the advancement of your church. Uh, Lord, if you are pleased with us, God, you will allow us to advance. God, uh, you will pour out your grace and favor, God, unlocking every door and potential, Father. We pray for all families that we love here this morning, God, uh, that you would just give them favor, God, uh, and your blessing, God, would be abundant, Father, Lord. Uh, and we, God, we desperately need you also in these last days, God. Increase our faith. Uh, give us stability, Father, God. Uh, let us trust in you in these last days, not looking to the left nor to the right. Uh, we give you all praise and glory in the name of Jesus, Brother Manny. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Then let's uh, take time to bless one another. We'll have a seat shortly. God bless you all. Test, test. Praise God. Amen. Good to be in the house of God this morning. God bless every single one of you. Amen. We're going to get to the preaching of the Word of God uh, shortly. Uh, don't forget our schedule. I know that we're all familiar here, but obviously we'll be back at 6.30 p.m. tonight with a new service, a prayer, uh, uh, 30 minutes. I know someone had told me 30 minutes before the service when we first got here. but So prayer at 6 uh, p.m. We'll be here at 6.30 uh, p.m. for the service tonight. Don't forget Wednesday service, Lord willing. Uh, that will be at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, that God could minister to us again in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, conference. Okay. Show of hands if you can go. Everybody. <laughs> so keep that in your calendars. Uh, it is official March 28th through the 1st. Our pastor should be sending you the big poster that was here last year uh, so that we can have that to remind us every day about that. And then I still haven't got the official flyer for Pastor Roderick Gonzalez a wonderful uh, evangelist of God. He's, he's, uh, he had a church in Houston, ended up in Florida, and then eventually back to the El Paso church, and he went to China for four years. Amen. So he will be uh, visiting us. Uh, the, I don't have the official, I have the official date, but it's not set in stone. Uh, April 24th, I believe it is. So that'll be after the conference, but I'll have it officially. I'm sorry. Um, for that date as well. Amen. So let us prepare for that uh, in Jesus' name. So if you notice, things kind of changed a little bit. Don't worry. All right. We're going to fix it up. I don't know how long we're going to stay in this building, but my wife, when she sees something, she's got to do something about it. So she has some ideas as well. I know we were thinking about um, 
a small um, altar space over here that we could build something, and then she's going to deck it out in the back just to make it feel a little different. So we wanted to maximize the space. I know this isn't the, you know, the biggest space that we have, but we're working with a property owner. And what he's thinking about is breaking some walls down. And uh, this is an idea that I have. Okay, so we want, uh, we, meanwhile, we stay here, and he said he'll do it for 100% free. So he'll build a wall over here. Kids stay on this side. We'll have a small kitchenette in the back over there with an actual sink in that very corner over there, and then we would break all of this down. Yeah. The refrigerator will go this side, and this will, we, can, we can push the seats as far as they can go back to the wall over there. So I asked him, now the goal is to move from here, okay? I actually want a, you know, a storefront windows where people can see us, but we got to make the best of this building. So I'm trying to stay positive without becoming disgruntled and being negative. No, I, I really appreciate everything that God has given us. So pushing the space back would allow us to have more seating to the back. And then uh, the other thing that God was telling me, why don't you put something on the window, some kind of sign, you know, from, you can see it from the outside, especially during the nighttime, uh, so that we can be out more in the forefront. I spoke to Brother Jerry. It is difficult to find this place, right? If you don't know, if you haven't been here, so we have to think of things to be a little bit more creative while we are here. So keep that in prayer, uh, and God will help us with that as well. And the other thing, as we are going to take the offering in just a moment, we're going to start slowly buying chairs. Now, someone got on my case said, what about the pews? The pews are fine. Amen. But how about a nice, comfortable individual seat, okay? Nice color, make it feel a little more modern. I spoke to Brother Randy Jaramillo. He sent me a link. They were $38 a chair. I thought they were like 90 bucks. They can be, but if you go to the right place, and I saw a picture of what he had, they're amazing. So we can slowly purchase them. I won't put them out so it's, it's, it's not a, a, you know, just something sticking out, but eventually we'll stack them in the back until we have enough number to get these out and then put uh, some brand new comfortable uh, chairs. Don't worry, we won't go to the folding chairs. Amen. Uh, so that just to make an investment back into the church, and then my wife has some ideas that we can do here. She thinks, I cut. That's how it works, amen. So keep that in mind. We're going to take an offering uh, this morning, whatever God puts in your heart as we're preparing for the future, amen. Let's continue to invest the kingdom of God. And I found this picture here and actually kind of got a hold of my heart. And it says here, when God blesses you financially, he says, don't raise your standard of living. He says, raise your standard of giving. Can you say amen? And a lot of times we think, again, with that hefty raise that we get, or it's a time or the season of increase, right? We raise our standards of living and say, wow, God has blessed abundantly. And surely the Bible, you know, does not condemn us enjoying life. He wants us to prosper, right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying the luxuries of life. But if we put this first, I believe they could teach us something wonderful. I'm going to read it again. It says, when God blesses you financially, he says, don't raise your standard of living. He says, raise your standard of giving. What has God put in your possession this morning? Right? We have an excess amount of certain things. And I know that we can splurge and we can, you know, spend on everything possible, but could it be that the Spirit of God and His grace has blessed you with something that maybe I don't have? Maybe someone over here doesn't have, but you have it this morning. And He says, I blessed you for this for a reason, that you would find it in your heart to invest in something in which uh, moths and robbers cannot touch, and that is the kingdom of God. Amen. I want you to consider that as we're bowing our heads uh, this morning and giving. Maybe God will uh, put something in your heart, and I was sharing this with the men as well. You know, even in, if whatever we give, even an extra $5 to put into uh, the chairs that we can get. Anything that we could invest into the kingdom of God and his church, Amen. That God would put that in your heart. Amen. As we're bowing our heads, we're close, closing our eyes. I'm going to ask Brother um, Aroni if you would lift your voice and ask God to help us this morning as we give. Amen. Hallelujah. Cash app thing is on the top over here. I'm going to put it on the live stream. You may see it. Multiple things happening. <laughs> got cameras, I got laptops, I got a tablet up here. But yeah, if you're watching the live stream, there's going to be uh, the cash app there. You can snap a photo of that, 
If not, the church's direct link is Potter's House MKE, oops, at the bottom. Uh, and you can give to the kingdom of God in that manner. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Everyone still love God this morning? Amen. We serve a powerful and an awesome God. I want you to turn your Bibles to John 16 in the Word of God. John 16 and verse 7. Amen. And I want to preach and minister that the Spirit of the Spirit that reveals. How many remember the day of salvation in which the Spirit of God revealed something to you in your very life? Nobody again. No. <laughs> the day of salvation in which he revealed the truth of the power of the gospel. There are some things in this life that you will never understand. Right? I never understood school. I'm like, why did he go to school? <laughs> History class, mom. I'm ringing. What, is, what does this have to do with life and reality? There are some things in this life that are incomprehensible. Some things that you will never figure out intellectually. And there are some things that we need to lay down. How, let me just say this this morning. Until we lay down the intellectual pride and leave it in the dust, there are some things that will never help us. God wants to challenge you today, ultimately with his spirit, to bring you to new revelation. Can you say amen? The world is on a collision course with judgment. Who can save them? I mean, you see the things that are happening in the world, and I tell my wife all the time, this world is on a collision course with judgment. Yet they don't see it because they have their form of truth. Uh, they have a form of wisdom, of intellect and knowledge. But can all of that really save them? You think of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, right, as they're creating these spacecrafts to go into another planet. Uh, and I think in their minds sometimes, do they really think that these things can save them? Right? Just abandon earth. Maybe Jesus will forget that we are on a different planet and no longer judge us. Would it be finding the missing link or the code to make men and women immortal and to live forever? Church, the problem is that sin has a, uh, men have a sin problem. Can you say amen again? Right? We need to be redeemed. Jesus, God himself, is coming to judge the world in righteousness and truth. Uh, and there will be a day that will dethrone any cataclysmic event that has ever happened in this life. Anything that we saw as completely disastrous, I'm talking about natural disasters, I'm talking about school shootings or anything that has ever happened, even the Holocaust itself, uh, when Jesus comes, the whole world will stop. Can you say amen? Coronavirus. I know it's going to step, right? It's going to step on people's toes here this morning. Amen. They call it the invisible killer. And yes, it is tragic, the loss that has happened through this virus that has gone global. It has affected the world globally. I mean, think of what the invisible killer did. It put a halt itself on life. Everything stopped on a global scale. Business were shut down. Churches were limited. People had to go and live life in a different manner. I remember for the first time hearing my pastor. He say, in, the fifth, in, the, in, the, in all my years of preaching, he says, I have never, ever thought that a virus could affect the church in this manner. On a global scale. If you see what's happening out in Australia, that's a different story, right? Locked down to the extreme of the invisible killer. Can I tell you something? You think COVID is bad? Even those on the live stream? The real pandemic is humanity unredeemed. The real pandemic is a person that has not received revelation from the Spirit of God to be saved. Spending a sinner's hell for all of eternity. Separated from a God who loves them. The argument is truth. And people call truth, right, the intellectual or the credentials that they have uh, as a form of truth, but they are rejecting the only provision in which God has made for man to be saved. That's Jesus Christ. The real pandemic is a soul unredeemed. You read John 17, 17, he says, sanctify, me by, uh, sanctify your, your people by the truth, for your word is the truth. If we refuse the truth, how will we be saved? I want to just read off of John 16 and verse 7. And 
apologize, those in the live stream, you know I would put that up for you, but I have two hands, and uh, if you turn your Bibles there as well, God will help you. Amen. Let's read the word. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, that, in, that it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. I want us to bow our heads in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the grace that we have received, God, and those who have been redeemed here this morning. For it was by the revelation of the Spirit of God that was promised, the advocate, the helper, that will come to convict us of sin. And there came a day of glory in which you shed the light on us. And for the first time, you used our spiritual eyes to see the truth. And though we were in the world that taught us a form of truth, it was a false truth. We have come to the light today, and the light has shined on us to show that what we have done in secret is seen plain by God. And we thank you for that day of revelation that brought us to humility, because through humility, men and women, humanity will find truth. We thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, and we all said, amen. Amen. We're living in the generation of truth seekers, right? Look throughout the news and every platform, a cable news network. It is about the facts. It is about the truth. And there's an argument on both sides. Never in my life, and I'm only 33 years old, ever seen a battle for truth. Like, no one really cared about truth, right? You know, it didn't really matter. This person can be doing that, and this one can do that. The Christians can do their things. But in 20 and 22, especially in 2021, again, there was an argument about truth. And they saw it more of a subjective matter. It was more of a form of opinion. Christianity can be subjective to you and irrelevant for me. But there was a time when regardless of the facts, people could agree to disagree. Amen? There was a time where we can just agree to disagree and to separate from one another. But as we sail closer to the end of days, truth is going to be the only thing that matters. Can you say amen? Right? To deny the truth will not change the facts. As a sinner out in the world, I could remember times uh, of looking up to the sky. I'm completely high. I have a cigarette in my mouth. uh, And I said, what is truth? And can this Bible really save me? But I would continue back in my other ways. You know the conviction that I had as a sinner? As I was in fornication as I was living out in the world on every drug possible, I said, if this God is truly real, I'm in trouble. Amen? The Spirit was trying to get a hold of my heart. And this is the job of the Spirit. I was thinking about this. God was showing me that there's four types of people concerning truth. Can I share those with you this morning? This may hurt a little bit, but God help me. And there are some who have cowardice. Cowards are afraid of truth. Ever met, ever met a coward when you try to tell them truth? They just, ugh, you know, they'll get away from you. It's like a person who is diagnosed with cancer and the, the doctor is trying to tell them, sir, you have cancer. No, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear it. I have the antidote, the doctor says. They, they run out of the hospital. Because a coward is afraid of the truth. There are those in laziness, well, they accept half the truth, right? <laughs> no research, they just kind of, They're lazy about it. Well, I'll listen to what cable news network tells me. And we have those with arrogance. They think they know all truth. Right? Ever met an arrogant person? They know all the truth. And then the fourth one would be, there are those with humility. They accept the truth objectively. I hated Jesus Christ at one point in my life. Remember the things that my grandmother had told me about the Lord and, you know, all the good that he had done, but I saw in the mirror, again, was just a monster. I said, if Jesus really loves me, why am I I at this stage of my life? Truth is coming this morning. And the Bible says that, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. In verse 7. 
It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper, thank God for the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And there was a time in my life, again, where I did not know the truth. I was a truth seeker, and I tested every, every walk of life. I drank of every water. I participated in a lot of ungodly things at 17 years old, experimenting and exploration about everything possible, drinking drugs, fornication, like I said, psychedelics. I was the cool guy with the cigarette in my mouth as I walked around uh, everything of life, but I did not know what the truth was. Remember the four walls of my house, my room. I was living with mother. <laughs> you know, and I thought I had truth, but every time I would come back after a party, there I was in loneliness and despair. There I was, again, facing the four walls, uh, wondering what truth was, uh, and again, I had not another high. I would sneak cocaine in my room. I'd lock the doors. So, Mother, I'm, I'm just hanging out here. I'm just snort, snorting cocaine just by myself. Back with my friends, I said, we have truth. We accepted everything possible. I told you the leader of my band was a homosexual. Let's all get along. Let's all just be happy. You know? Everyone has their form of truth and ideologies and things that make them. Why have conflict? I agreed with abortion. One of the more serious relationships, or so I thought. It's like, yeah, abortion's okay. We can't afford him or her. You know? I mean, we love, you know, we love the fornication part, but when it comes to responsibility, truth is that we can't have this child. See, that was my form of truth, but what is truth really? The Spirit who will reveal the truth again in three ways. And I want to show you that in verse 8. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, which is truth, he says, And when he comes, the Holy Ghost, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Can you say amen? amen? These are the things that the Holy Spirit, these are the attributes that we will notice on the world today. The question is, have you experienced these three forms of truth that he will come to convict you with. I don't care what your emotions feel, right? I don't care what you think truth is. Sometimes we apply our truth into Christianity. It's not truth. If it contradicts the word of God, it isn't valid. The question is, is have you experienced them? Will you accept them or reject them? In the world that we live in, even now, in 20 and 22, you know, uh, truth is just whatever is available. It's about intelligence and credentials and what kind of schooling that you... I've met people that, did you know I have a degree in yada yada? I'm like, so what? I have a PhD and I've gone to school for over eight years. That's like, okay. What does that mean? My brother, who went to college, and I'm not minimizing him, and he could very well be watching on the live stream right now. You know, he got educated. I was actually very proud of him. I got a good enough diploma, GED. And I remember, Andrew, you know, why don't you just get your diploma, just get out of high school. That's not for us. It's not for the Vasquez family, you know? There's other ways to have a form of education, of knowledge. So we, I got my GED, he went in there, he said, no, I want to do it the right way. I said, yeah, well, go ahead, you ended up graduating. Pursued college. Seeking a lot of things, very ambitious and determined as he was acquiring a knowledge of truth. I got a phone call, I was setting up the live stream, we were pretty much... Uh, demolishing everything in this church and getting rid of it, and I get the phone call, your brother's back in, in jail. He just got, he had just previously uh, got out of jail a week prior. He's struggling with opio opioids, right, narcotics. They kicked him out of his apartment. I mean, he just, it just all messed up. Saw a picture of him, and I just couldn't believe it. I broke down in tears. She said, this is who your brother was. He's holding his degree, and he's smiling, looking sharp, and he's rugged, and Distraught, you can see, you know, he, he has, he's thinning out in the face and starting to age, and I'm like, that's not my brother. 
This is the guy who knew the truth, who had you know, his life in order and things in perspective, and he came to church a few times, uh, but she said he got arrested. He went back to the house he was evicted from. They broke into the house and thought they could live there again. I'm like, in the kingdom, truth is more than just having intelligence and credentials, right? Even Paul said, he said, I, he said, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I have learned the way. I was, a tr- uh, I was of the tribe of Benjamin from a young age. I could recite the Shema. I can do all these things. But he said, all that is rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. He said, everything from my past life and the knowledge that I have acquired is nothing compared to knowing the truth, which is Jesus Christ. This is why he approached the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. He says, I choose to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Because this is all that matters. That is all the truth, beloved church. Let me tell you here today, you may not be the smartest person. Amen. But if you have the form of truth, because God is the epitome of truth. Amen. There are some people here, you may have a high IQ. There are some here, you may have a low IQ. Not offending anyone. There may be some people here today that you haven't had a clue about nothing. I know. But you know Jesus Christ. You know the Savior. And that's all that matters in this life. You don't need a badge of approval. You don't need something around your arm or a tag or a pin on your suit this morning to make you someone in the kingdom of God because God will accept you as you are. I thought I knew it all. The Spirit promises to reveal these three truths that I showed you. Let's read it again. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The the Spirit still promises to do these things. Is he doing this in your life? Right? I want to look at the first one. Because he promises to convict the world of sin. He promises to come down uh, and inform all people and guilty where they stand to show them that they are in conflict and error with God. Have you ever experienced that before? As rational human beings, we have the God-given ability to know right from wrong. There is no excuse for that. Can you say amen? You can go to any, even third world countries, and they know that right is wrong, murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, right? Coveting is wrong. They know these things. As rational human beings, we know the right from wrong. The spirit is already at work at people. Therefore, we stand without shame before the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit allows us to have sensitivity to his voice, to hear him. At the secret of night, should I do this, right? Come on, somebody. Should I pursue this while my wife is not watching? When I'm at work, can I do these things without getting caught? But the Holy Spirit, you know within your heart this morning, the spirit of truth that that will convict your life and say, don't do it. For there are consequences for certain things. When Jesus was saying this, he said, I'm sending my Holy Spirit and he will convict the world of sin. Every single human being will be without excuse. Everything will be seen as plain as day according to Hebrews. And that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. Look at Hebrews 10, 16. He says, this is the covenant I will make with them after the time, says the Lord. I will put what? My law is in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. What is he saying? There comes a day when the Spirit is going to convict people. They're going to be without excuse, knowing that what they are doing is wrong, and it would lead them to a decision in their life. This is why altar call is so important. As I preached Wednesday, amen. It's a very pivotal moment, a very important moment, where we're making contact with the Creator and saying, God, something happened in my heart today. The preacher, as you were speaking through him, said something that convicted my life, and I want to run away from it. Can you say amen? This is what the Spirit of God does. He says, I'm going to put my laws in their hearts, and I'm going to write them on their minds. What did this mean back in the Old Testament? If you remember, you know, they would put this thing up here and bind the laws around their head, and they would uh, carry certain things as a reminder that God, uh, they had made a covenant with God, but he says, in the new generation that is coming, I'm going to put all of that uh, in their mind and in their hearts so that they would know right from wrong and they would be convicted. There was a season in my life where there was heavy conviction before I got saved. Anyone ever felt at peace when you were out in the world, right? That you were kind of like, what am I doing? 
There were certain things that I would do, I would literally throw up after doing them, right? I'm talking about, I was like, what is wrong with me? I'd be doing the, nothing was the same. I could be watching a certain movie, and I'm like, why am I watching these things? I wasn't even saved at the time. Pornography and all kinds of filth that we pass around like baseball cards to the friends. I'm like, why do I have this stuff, you know? This is the things that I thought was truth, uh, and it is just a part of life. I remember one time, thank God. My wall, you know, I had, you had your certain stash of, of magazines and all that dirty stuff. All broken and torn up in my room. I'm like, mother? And she starts yelling at me. Thank God for that. Of just filth and disgust, and I said, what am I doing? I tried meditation, beloved. That's right. Seeking philosophy. I was seeking Greek scholars, right? I was looking at the Homer's Ilmad and how to live life better and how you can attain greater knowledge just to soothe the conscience. But the last thing that was on, on my mind was the Word of God. Oh, not this one. I started to listen to instrumental music from all types of worlds and regions. Really. Because it would help my conscience. It was disturbed. It was disrupted. It was convicted because of sin, and nothing was able to change it. I would go day in and day out, constantly convicted, and God says, I'm preparing a day. You're either going to listen to the Spirit of God that deals with you today, or you will never be at peace. And I was like, what is this feeling? Again, no one had witnessed to me yet. Why am I feeling like this? We started trends and styles. Well, maybe if I change my style. I told you I put a big patch of red on my head on the back, and I'd spike it and flip this over. I said, maybe if I wear this type of clothing, maybe someone will accept me. Maybe if I wear this over here or hang out with this crowd or accept these type of people, I can feel at peace. But, beloved, nothing ever helped because the Spirit of God was already at work in my life. We have to learn to deal with this. And Jesus said, when I bring the Spirit of God, he will convict people of sin. That's right. When we are smoking on the joint, we should not feel comfortable. When we are looking at certain things or have a certain mindset, the Spirit of God, he says, you better believe I promise that he's going to come and convict you of this. I'm not going to allow my people to stay in a right mind uh, or in a zombie state uh, and contentful for the things that they are doing. I thank God for those convictions. I heard my pastor, Paul Stevens, preach one time. I'm like, man, he's preaching. He's praying witchcraft. But he would pray on certain people, and I would listen to him, and he says, I pray that this person, you know, he'd, you'd fill in the blank with anybody. He said, it's not comfortable in this room. I feel that they would feel a conviction and feel disgusted of the things that they're doing in their lives that would lead them to repentance. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul told uh, a person he was dealing with that he was very harsh to him, and he said, you know what, I'm glad I was harsh, even though I know that I went a little too far, because that hard preaching that I gave you led you to the man that you are today. Can you say amen? The Spirit of God will use its power that has been given through the name of Jesus Christ to convict people of sin. Have you resisted it? The second one is of righteousness. He says, I'm coming for sin and for righteousness. The Lord wants to perform heart surgery on you today. Amen? Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Will you allow that? Will you allow the great physician to change your mentality, change the way you think? You could be committing idolatry today, even as a church kid. What do I mean by that? And there are some Christians like a buffet, right? They start to create a God. I like, I like what this God does, and I put this one here. And you create a God in your own image. Your God likes the things you like and hates the things that you hate. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit to teach you the ways of God. So he's first going to convict you of sin. He says, I'm going to teach you how to live for me, but I have to remove the heart that you have currently at this very moment. I'm sharing some of my testimony here. I remember... Picking up, we had an adventure Bible in the house. You know, the kids' Bible, was, I still remember, it was purple, it was all folded up. No one really read it, but it was just crinkled up, and 
There was one time, again, a cigarette in my mouth. I had a buzz going, and I'm just like, I'm going to read this here because there's supposed to be truth in it. And I was looking at the things that it demanded. I said, I can't do that. Why serve him? Because as soon as I try to serve him, I'm going to fail at this area here. See, I had no understanding of the word of God. I didn't know what sanctification was about. Amen. I didn't know what grace was about at that very time. So to me, it just seemed like a book of rules without understanding that the Spirit was the one that was supposed to give me a new heart and a new mind. And through those convictions, beloved, I tell you what, I've learned to be able to live for Christ. No longer was Christ a burden. For that reason, John says uh, very clear in 1 John in chapter 2, he says the laws of God are not burdensome to his people. Right? It is not a chore to serve God. It is actually a joy and a pleasure. But in my what I thought was truth, again, I was completely confused. I was confined by the ways of the world. Therefore, Christ did not make sense. But you see, the Spirit will teach us of righteousness. Not in your own strength but in the ability of Jesus Christ. He will also convict the world of judgment. See, Jesus defeated the power of death. And there are two things in this life that we can't escape from. Remember I told you. (laughs) There are two things that we can't escape from in this life. One is paying your taxes. And two is death. You can't escape those things. And what is happening in the world today, again, is people are afraid of death. The world, I don't care what kind of facade they have, they are scared of death because they don't want to know about what happens after this life. One of the questions I ask when, I, when, you know, when we're outreaching is, do you know where you're going after, after this life? They're, and I'll tell them the same thing just to kind of break the ice. I'm like, there's two things you can't escape in this life. One is paying your taxes. The other one, it, which is inevitable, is death. To an unbeliever, which I can testify of this, death was a time of doom and gloom. It was a time of end. It was a time of ceasing to exist, so I thought. It was a time of losing all the memories that had been been built up, all the fun that I thought that I had out in the world. But, But to a believer, death is just the beginning of life. And this is the hope that Jesus wants to leave you with. Because the world will give you a form of truth. But Jesus said, though you die... I'll raise you on the last day. Though you cease to exist physically in this world, uh, I will raise you to life uh, on the next. And therefore, in John, I haven't put it up here, John 5, 24, he says, Verily, truly, I tell you that anyone who believes in me will not be judged or not be condemned, but will cross over from death to life. That's what he says. He says that if you put your trust in the truth, You will no longer be judged. You will no longer be condemned, but you will cross over from death to life. What a bargain that is. But see, to the world, that doesn't make sense. And therefore, because of that, the world stands condemned before God. Have you allowed God to convict you of sin? Have you allowed God to convict you of righteousness, how to live for him? And have you allowed God to convict you that there comes a time of judgment? This was the promise of the Holy Spirit that would come to this world to show people how to live. People fear death because of the possibility of a day of judgment. I want to show you a picture here of Indian Red Boy, an L.A. rapper, who is now in eternity, decided to go live stream when they shot him. And I know these are, but that was him and his composure before. If you see the other pictures, he's got gang signs, and he's wearing his pants halfway down his back. And he portrayed himself as, I don't know, a gangster, right? Because that's gangster. And in most of their uh, mentality and thinking, because they have truth, so-called truth, they portray themselves as being tough guys, right? You ever met one? Like they're fearless to the end, but when he got a, a, a several shots in the chest and in the neck, the composure changed. Once a man of stability, of might and control, and you know he was a rapper and had a name for himself, he is now confronted with death. 
And at that very moment, again, his composure changed. I don't recommend you watch the video, but his composure changed. There was something in his heart that was fighting for what? To live. Oh, that's what people do when they're dying. They want, yeah, but he knew that there was going to come an end. He knew that this was the end of his rapping career, and the composure changed. And as he's here, you know, the blood is filling up his lungs, and it's, I'm sorry for that, but he's coughing it out, and he's saying, help me, help, help. While his friend was live on the other side, watching his friend perish as he's slipping into eternity. And I'm looking at this, and I said, this is what the world is. They have a form of truth, but when reality comes and the curtains close, we want the real truth. Can you say amen? amen? It is at the final hour that we're like, I need that. Where's the Bible? Where's the Jesus? Where's the priest to give me the last rites at this very moment? But beloved, your fate is sealed when the time comes. The decisions that you made in this life do not matter anymore. And again, it was only on the provision of Jesus Christ who can save your very life. Uh, and I don't know where this man is. I'll leave that in God's hands. But there was a reality check that happened where the real truth was confronted in his very life. What are the defining moments in your life as we're closing? Because let's be real this afternoon. There's a lot of truth in this world, in the world of information, but which one can save your soul? It was once said that truth is as a powerful lion, right? Big, mighty, powerful, bold, courageous lion. It doesn't need your help to defend it, just unlock the cage. Amen? Right? Lion doesn't need your help to defend it, you just let it out. And the problem with Christianity and in the last days is that we're trying to defend the truth. I let the truth speak for itself. And sometimes we contain it and place it in a cage, the power of the Holy Spirit that wants to be demonstrated in the life of an individual. But the Bible says, I don't need your help, right? God, God said, I don't need your help to prove that I am truth. I want you to speak on the behalf of truth, but let the truth be known. And in my very lives, again, I didn't think this was possible, beloved. All I started to see was a life that was transformed. The truth uh, was playing out in my very life, uh, was changing and conforming me into the image of Christ. And I'm completely amazed. Amen? Of the transformation power that happened through the conviction of sin, the teaching of righteousness, and understanding that one day there will be accountability. I was doing a funeral out in the north side again. I spoke to an individual. And he was a very nice man. And he says, you know, back in the days, it wasn't like this. The shooting and killing. And back then, we had fun kicking cans. But nowadays, these young guys, you know, they pull out a gun for everything. I said, what do you think it is? And he says, the problem is that they don't think they're, they're accountable to anybody. You mean the police? No. Even the creator. In their eyes, there is no creator. There is no accountability. Therefore, they can go 100 miles down the street passing red lights and not care about anyone but themselves. See, it's about themselves. And again, he was in the casket. There's two young teens out for a joyride going 100 miles, lost control, hit a tree. He said he didn't even recognize them. They, they, things were missing. Heads were missing. It just, that's what happens. It's a day of fun. See, in their eyes, that was truth. But I thank God for the salvation that he gave me because I shouldn't end up in the grave. There's a point in my life, again, going out and about, having a blast. I mean, we were higher than can be. I was buying all the beer at that time. I met this uh, new group of friends, and we're driving out. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Spirit began to deal with me again, and I testify this as the truth as we're closing I still remember this feeling of disgust in my heart and life. I'm in the back seat. We got beers and brews and we got the coke, everything. I'm one of those guys who party till 8 in the morning and then you wake up three hours later and you keep going. I'm not making it up. It was 11, 8, 8, 11 p.m. at night. And I told these guys, I said, you know what? I want to go home. They're like, what? 
my other friend who was there, he's like, bro, you're crazy. The night has just gotten started. I said, I want to go home. I don't feel right right now. He says, Vince, you've got to be kidding. Just have another beer. It's going to be okay, man. we got lots to do. And we were sitting back there. I said, I want to go home. Drops me off home. You know, I kept drinking there in the room. I'm thinking about what is happening in my mind. The next day, obviously, I go to work hungover. I saw the driver the next day. I'm sorry, the passenger of that car. He says, man, I'm glad you went home. And I said, why? He's like, don't say anything, but you had to abandon the car. You totaled it. He says, the place where you were sitting was so crushed that you would have been dead. You would have been complete. He said, there's no way possible a human body would have fit in that spot in the back seat where you were. So he laughed about it. He's like, you're actually lucky you did went home that night. I said, what did you do with the vehicle? We just called the cops and said it was stolen. So I would have been just some guy there with a stolen vehicle, dead in the car, with a case of, you know, Bud Lights on the side. But see, the spirit was already convicting me. He says, get out of that car. I have destiny for your life. Respond to the dealings of the Holy Spirit because I will give you a future. Do not delay on the dealings of the Lord. I will teach you of righteousness. Do not delay on the convictions that I place forth here to you today because it will save your life and it will save your soul. On that day, beloved, I believe that that was God's will for me to get out of that. It was a final opportunity to respond to the dealings of life. And though I had not reached an altar yet, he was preparing the way. He says, I know that you will respond today. I will save you from the tragedy that is to happen. And I look back today and at the friends that I had, they don't care about you. Though they say they were friends, beloved, they were willing to leave me there if things had gone that way. And say, someone stole our car and we don't know the guy that's back there. But I felt the Holy Spirit's convicting me. It's not a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling again of, of conviction. It's a feeling again that leads us into the path of righteousness. Last scripture for today, if you read this, it says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. This is truth. For the spirit searches all things. Can you say amen? All things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of which, of the man which is in him, is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have, I'm sorry, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now watch this. These things we also speak, not in words which, man, uh, which man's wisdom teaches. It says world truth, we don't care about that, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 14 is very important. It says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. That's why I thought the Bible was foolish. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually what? Discerned. We can't understand the Bible no matter how we try unless the Spirit of God is living within our lives. It is the revealer of all things. And therefore, we can conclude uh, this afternoon that what Jesus said is true. He says, I will send my Spirit. He says, it's better if I go because I am one physical person. But when I leave, the Holy Spirit will be able to deal with every single person, multitudes and masses, giving them new hearts, uh, new spirits, uh, convicting them of unrighteousness and teaching them of righteousness. And therefore, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit because they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You're a miracle here today, and I'm not trying to fluff you up, right? Flattery is sin. But what I'm saying here today, if you can hear the sound of my voice, and if you have a concept or understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord, that sin is sin, and we need to get rid of that, amen, then you're in a good spot. You're in a position to learn from God of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 15 says, but he who is spiritual... Judges all things. Amen. What does that mean? When I came to Christ, I said, we're judging everything. Everything that comes into this house is going to be judged. You mean the filthy movies? Yeah, that too. Yet he himself is righteous. I'm sorry, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. 
16 concludes, for whom has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see that? The Spirit is the revealer in the form of truth because God cannot lie. He is the epitome of truth. He is truth. Like I say, you may not be intelligent. Maybe you are. But as long as we hold on to the form of truth, which is the word of God, everything is possible. The wisdom and the philosophy of cable news network, you know, do I trust in that or the spirit of God? I'm, I'm going to trust in God. All right. Let every man be a liar. Let God be the truth. And because of the things that I did, beloved, I want to just tell you here this afternoon before we leave, my life has changed beyond what I can believe. If you really saw who I was before, you wouldn't believe it. The mentality and thinking, the way of perceiving things, and you know, I would switch things around, I would manipulate things and to, just to make them to fit my reality. I've tested the things of this life. And none of it has ever brought the truth that I have received today. And because of that decision, can I tell you, my family is blessed. All right? From the wreck that I was, my children no longer have to see an alcoholic father. High out of his mind, right? Never showing up. In and out. But they have received the truth because of the decision that I've made. And I thank God for that. We've broken a curse. We've laid a new foundation in teaching the little ones of truth, and I will never turn back because of this. Are you ready for truth tonight, this afternoon? God wants to help you, amen, to find that. I want you to bow your heads in Jesus' name. Before we leave tonight, you may have been instructed in a way that you think is truth. But the Bible is very clear. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through me. But notice what he said. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And what that means is it silences every tongue to incorporate themselves into truth. He says, I am the the only way. I am the only form of truth. He says, exclusively me. And people don't like that text because it dethrones every type of philosophy. It dethrones lifestyle and living. He says, the only way to find the truth is to believe in me. And maybe God is dealing with you here before we leave. You have a form of truth, but you don't have the truth. It's going to be a very sobering moment, beloved. This is the only life that you have. The day that you stand before the living God to give an account for your life. Your philosophy will not help you. Your credentials will not help you. Your superiority, what you have learned in college will not help you. He's going to ask, what did you do with my son who was the truth? And so to be saved. Why wait for that sobering reality? And I thank God because he's dealing with you right now the way that he dealt with me as a sinner. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And before we leave, you are ready to come to the living truth. Don't delay any longer, amen. Come to Jesus here this afternoon. I want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that is me. I want the truth today. I may not understand it. Neither did I. I may not know what to do. What is the step process? Beloved, we live by faith every day. There is no blueprint. Everything that happens in this life, again, by faith. You want to come to Jesus. Amen. I want you to lift your hand all over this place. Amen. Don't worry about the person next to you. This is between you and God. I want you to lift your hand. Say, preacher, that is me. I want to come to Jesus. I want to know the Savior. I want to know the truth. I want to experience the things that you experienced. Uh, I want everything that God has for my life. I want you to raise your hand. Do not delay. What if this is the only chance? Life is fragile. 
The Bible says that life is but a passing shadow. You're here today and gone the next. Eternity is but a heartbeat away, beloved. I wish we knew what tomorrow had to bring, but we don't know. But you are sure today that you want to give it to Jesus. One more time, before we leave, raise your hand. Acknowledge that before, not me, not men, but God himself. You can find that truth, beloved. God is dealing with you at this very moment. Hallelujah, amen. And speaking to Christians here, before we come to the altar, amen, and get a hold of God, remember what I said, very simple message this morning. Amen, let, allow, let God allow to deal with you in this area of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. When we walk the straight and the narrow, beloved, we can, everything is possible with Christ. We leave no opportunity for the devil's schemes at all, and we have to learn this every day. Right? We don't just tip our hat to the Lord and everything's fine, beloved. We, there's a reason for a fight. In a fight, there are two opponents. One will win, one will lose. For this reason, Jesus said in Matthew 24, for those that endure till the end shall be saved. That means there's a possibility of conflict. There's a possibility of losing the fight. And so be shipwrecked, as Paul said. I want us all to stand. Amen. Let us come to the altar. Amen. Let us bow. Uh, before the throne of Jesus, amen. Let us humble our hearts, amen. God, help us with the truth this morning, amen. Heavenly Father, Jesus, deal with the conditions of our hearts, God. Hallelujah. Let's fill the altars in this place, amen. If you're capable of bowing, amen, do so. Let's just get a hold of God. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We love you, God. Father, we may not understand everything that is happening, God, but truly we come, God, with humbled hearts and lives here today. God, help us in our ways, Lord Father, as we need you. Reveal to us unto the truth, God. We reject every lie, everything of the enemy. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, pour out your spirit in the name of Jesus. Help us, God. Keep us right with you. Convict us of sin, God, in all ungodliness in the name of Jesus, God. Forgive us our debts, God. Forgive us our sin, our complacency, Father. Allow the Spirit to deal with us on a daily basis, God. Let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling, God. My Lord, my rock, and my Savior, you are King. You are holy in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, my Lord and my rock. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. God is dealing. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit. Amen. Brother Angel, I want you to come over here, brother. I have a word for you. Yes, sir. How old are you now? 14. What's that? 14. All right. You'll be making some big decisions. Okay? Now, the world has a form of truth that it gives to people. Remember, it's not always truth. And at your age, a lot of things that come up, I want you to trust in Jesus like you've never been before. You know, there's certain things in your life that you may not always understand, even like I said here today. But if you humble yourself and accept the form of truth, even at your age, God will use you. King David was 15 years old, right? 15. Nowadays, for the, you know, people 15, they're playing on TikTok, right? King David says, I got kingdom business to do. I got things that concern the plans of my father. I got things that are going to help me to be who he's called me to be. And at 14, even though confusion comes here sometimes, know that God loves you, okay? Some things may not make sense, even whether it be household, at school, even, uh, in, even in your time of study, but God loves you. But the things that you do now are going to affect the future. So it can take you on a trajectory of success for God to help you grow in who he's called you to be, or it can lead you into a path that is completely far left from God. And we can begin to drift away from God and forget the things that we're taught. I want you to appreciate the things that you learned. Okay? You have a foundation that I never had. So you actually should be more successful and more powerful in the kingdom of God. I didn't have this foundation. Church was optional. Don't have to go to church. But you have the advantage here and I want you to take advantage of that. And if you do, God will help you. Okay? Only you can decide that. But I want the spirit of God. 
Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we give this young man here to you today. Brother Angel, who you have called and ordained, Father, you knew his life. And I thank you for the decision of his parents. I thank you for Evie and Manny, God. And though he knows that he has got to make these decisions on his own, fill him with righteousness and truth. And Father, let not him be deterred by the things his friends say, God. For there will come times of confusion and even decisions that will try to pull him away, but you will shield him, God. Do not allow the devil to distract him, but give him power and power from on high. We give this life unto you, God. Do with him as you please, for he belongs to you. And he is a member of the flock, God. We thank you for his life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's give God praise. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Man, we're going rejoicing, bowing our heads uh, tonight. Amen. I'm going to do a kind of uh, teach, preach tonight. And uh, just want to, um, um, lost my train of thought there. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> Pulling up on the, the title of the sermon, but uh, talking about soul sleep. Now, it's unbiblical, but I want to show you, again, according to the Word of God. So I want to kind of teach it and articulate it. Against that, these are things that Jehovah's Witness believe uh, in talking about the body and the resurrection that is to come. Amen. The future that we hold. Amen. As we're bowing our heads, amen. Come tonight. Uh, you can be here at prayer 6 p.m. We'll have the service at 6.30, and God will help us again. Rejoice, fellowship, uh, and do, uh, Lord willing, we will come tonight. Brother Jerry, if you lift your voice and help us, uh, pray to this afternoon. Amen. God bless you all. Uh, God bless everyone who's watching the live stream. We love, we love you. We care for you. Uh, continue to love Jesus. And uh, Lord willing, we will see you when the time is right. We are out. God bless. You too.